welcome to Downtown Design's virtual talk called Conscious Design Strategies for the Real World. My name is Aiden Manova and I'm the editor of Identity Magazine. And joining me today is architect and designer Alfred Khan, David G. Daniels, the director of architecture at SSH, Kurash Salehi, the design director of LWK and Partners, and Pallavi Dean, design educator and the founder of War Design Studio. Today's talk, we will discuss how design can solve problems that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to light and how we can use this opportunity to build more resilient communities worldwide. Um, I'd first like to ask you all, you know, in your view, uh, what are some issues that we've seen, you know, arise as a result of the pandemic? You know, it could be something that we were sort of discussing and looking at pre-COVID, but it had maybe sort of escalated and became a much more, you know, bigger reality uh, with the pandemic. Um, maybe ask if you'd like to start us off. Speaking from, from, from like my own community, um, I felt a strong uh, sense of isolation between people. Um, this was obviously for safety and for, for, for you know, the, the kind of social responsibility we had to each other. Mm. But um, I, got a, I got a very strong sense of uh, um, having to do things for ourselves. And I think that created a, a sort of um, a sur upsurge in, in our own um, resourcefulness. So like things which I feel I've always wanted to do, like learn how to do gardening, or learn how to um, spend more time with my kids and do like home learning with them and things like that. I had a chance to do that and to see them in a way which was sort of idyllic in a way. We were lucky not to be kind of personally affected by by COVID, uh, so we were able to concentrate of kind of creating new um, interactions with ourselves. But on the other hand, uh, within the local community here, I felt like the elderly disappeared. They had no way of kind of um, of connecting with the wider community. Um, the um, the shopkeepers became heroes, which was amazing. They were kind of they were sort of disregarded as a kind of the lowest rung of society in a way, but then they became the most important, the glue that kept everyone together. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I think I was a bit disappointed that um, in the UK our school system and our uh, our governance just felt a little bit lacking in in the way that it was taking care of us and taking care of kids. So I think we felt uh, this survival instinct came in um, a little bit like, uh, but also with that can come a little bit of um, selfishness. And I think that's, uh, it's it's only like a few weeks away from, from being, you know, we felt like a few weeks away from disaster, mm -hmm. uh, absolute disaster. You, know, you can see how society is such a fragile thing um, and it relies on a kind of, uh, a lot of unsaid um, rules and unsaid bonds between people and organizations and you know you could start to see how that could it was uh, uh, we were very close to to this all being um, um, sort of flying away so yeah I mean I, I I'll add a bit more add a bit more later I really miss having hugs from people <laughs> a really basic thing and the first time I hugged my parents like uh, when after the first lockdown it was just the most amazing thing I forgot how important physical contact is yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in Dubai, for example, on Pallavi, what, what are some things that you sort of noticed as well, you know, within or maybe even just within space, you know, spaces and spaces that we inhabit? What were some sort of issues that you noticed that came to light due to the pandemic? You know, um, I'm OCD. That's kind of my personality, right? So density in space and kind of the lack of sanitizing sanitization in space has always been a concern for me. So I thought COVID was like this grand big reset. I was like, this is great. Now when I try on something, they're going to actually steam clean it before someone else tries that on. Brilliant. You know, things like, you know, a CrossFit class, normally you'd share all the equipment. My God, I really don't want to touch anyone's sweaty germs. So for me, being OCD, being this type of personality, it started off with a lot of fear. Started off with a lot of fear of being in proximity with people. And then obviously as the situation evolved, I understood that no, you kind of have to break out of this and you have to go back to life. Picking up on what Asif said, as a designer, the big change was that sensory deprivation, right? Like one of our senses was taken away, touch which is so important for what I do in spaces. It's about tactility. And that was the first thing to go. And another thing, again, as I've touched upon it, is mental health. You know, we forget, we spend 89% of our time 
indoors, right? Architecture is beautiful, but you experience it for a very short-lived period of time. And that environment affects how you feel, how productive you are, or how well you feel. So for me, I almost think like our jobs have become that much more important with what, what's happening around us. Yeah, absolutely. And um, David, um, can I have a bit of your thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I mean, Pilati and uh, Asif have kind of covered that social kind of dynamic. For, for me as well, the other thing I would touch into there is from a, from a work point of view, from a design point of view, it's the thing we've really missed is being in rooms with fellow designers and creators, because you can do great things like this over a Zoom call or a Teams call, but actually being in a space with a fellow creative, someone and going through that process, reading their emotions, reading their reactions to you. It, it's a whole new dynamic now, especially like a lot of presentations we're doing to clients and that over team calls, it's it's a complete different change, but trying to create over a team call is just, it's impossible. So we're working very hard to create spaces where we can actually come together and, and kind of take back those kind of qualities that we've missed for the past six months, really. And it's, it's, it's a whole new way of designing spaces, as Pallavi said, a kind of going forward, how are we going to create studios, offices, meeting rooms even, just how do those spaces evolve now that we've got this whole new dynamic? Because mm -hmm. I think it's something that's going to be with us for quite a long time, if not purely because of COVID, but just because of our kind of the turmoil we've all been through for the past six months. Yeah, and I mean, just in terms of, you know, communities and the way that people interact, we're now finding ourselves being quite different within spaces, you know, whether it's proximity and just, you know, as uh, Polly was saying, you know, you send the sensory sort of element of it as well. Um, in terms of now sort of designing for spaces in the future, how do you see that sort of impacting it in the long run? I mean, as we said, we don't know what the long term impact of this of this is going to be, but just sort of it also impacting or considering sort of wider topics as well within that. How do you think we're going to design with these sort of thoughts in mind? Well, I think the first thing and the easy kind of thing is obviously the, the idea of kind of the monitoring stations when you enter a mall, you know, you have that thermal check, um, you know, kind of public conveniences and that, you know, the washing of hands is so much more important. Now, you go to the mall here, the old time that I go to the mall here in the bathrooms, are, you know, they become a, a great place of angst. How do we start to actually break that down and make, make that experience, you know, comfortable again for people? Uh, but and also, also from, from a spatial standpoint, point of view, I think, you know, developers are going to have to spend a lot more time now, I think, kind of considering their briefs, especially around communities. Um, because if you watch people, I, I live in the ranches, you know, and I watch people how they interact now. Before dropping the children off at school, you know, it was a very closely contact thing. But now people physically keep their distance. That's, that's not good as a society where we're naturally social beings. We naturally, as you said, you know, that hug from his parents and that. You want that interaction. That, that makes us better people. So how do we design our urban landscape as well as our buildings to, to try and bring that comfort back in for me is, is a really important um, process that I think as designers, as planners and architects, we have to go through over the next hopefully over the next six months, you know, and start coming up with those ideas that we can start to explore with the people that build our communities. Yeah, um, Kurush, maybe you'd like to weigh in on that as well. Cities are sort of defined by their, by their capacity to create safe environments. I mean, their cities are put together as defensive measures. Just look at the earliest human habitation, you know, it's all about protecting the clan, protecting the family, whether it's wars or diseases or enemy attacks, it's all about safety. And when that, that, that uh, sort of that threat goes to the core of our, our, our cities and our civilization, um, again, Asif made a great point. Um, a, a friend of mine got stuck in, in New York um, uh, from his, his apartment. He was recording almost a daily record of showing me of the demonstration and the, the disorder. I mean, when, when the order of society was breaking down, uh, it, 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 it was truly fear, fearful that, that for um, sort of advanced economies to sort of you know, again, uh, like we said, that the, 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 the fragility of our, our law and order was, 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 was sort of there in front of us. 
Um, and I think that's, you know, how delicate uh, and fragile we are um, uh, was, was reminded very well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, you like touched upon you know, public space. That has now become something that, you know, probably was designed with one sort of thought in mind, whereas now it has to be really sort of reconsidered in terms of the way people are interacting, but also in terms of actually making sure that people who are, you know, using these spaces actually feel a sense of belonging or actually feel like, like they've been considered, you know, within these spaces. Um, you know, how do you think you can sort of you know, design public spaces or even, you know, private spaces that really respond to, you know, people's needs? I mean, we don't, no, we don't like no longer have time to sort of do on ground research and ask people, you know, what what does your community need? Or like some cities have that, whereas other, others don't. But in terms of design considerations, how can we ensure that, you know, various communities are actually positively being impacted by these public spaces? Yeah. If, if I can step in there, right? Like, I just want to draw a parallel. So in the 1920s, when the Spanish flu broke out, right? I would say there was a direct architectural response to that. Modernism, that's what it was. People said, you know, to hell with the ornamentation, let's move away from this because that hides all the germs. And I think everyone's looking to design as an architect now and thinking, oh my God, what's that fundamental shift going to be to design, to architecture, to public spaces? But maybe it's not about a fundamental shift, right? Maybe it's about like, you know, Kurush just touched upon, you should think about context. I mean, for us, that's just a given, right? You are off the place, from the place. You can't design in isolation of it. So for me, COVID is just accelerating some of the design trends that we should have considered anyways, empathy being at the core of it, right? We're designing for people and that is at the core of what we do. You know, we had this whole kind of era of star architects and everybody was kind of just building a name for themselves and creating this jewelry like architecture. Was it functional? Did it create an experience within the space? I don't know. You know, that's a that's a different debate in itself. But what I'm trying to say is that architecture is not the solution to COVID. You know, medicine is and there are people who are working on it. Brilliant. And I know we can all sit here and feel self-important and talk about how we're making a change. We're talking about basics like proxemics. I mean, this is a study in design that we all at some stage um, have studied. And I think what's really going to be interesting is Expo 2020, which is an Expo 2021. Um, but that's going to be interesting, right? Because we're going to have a huge volume of people, people from different psychological and cultural backgrounds, right? So everyone's fear factor is different. I said, I'll probably very different, you know, Asif was hugging his parents. I was still like, uh, you just got off a plane. Can we use this as an excuse never to touch each other again? You know <laughs> what I mean? So we have to kind of talk about this. And I think Asif, you're doing some work with Expo. So I'd love to kind of discuss a massive, you know, exhibition like that and how we're going to deal with it. Uh, maybe I should come back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it, it's, it's definitely, uh, a challenge and it will be it will be in some way yeah probably the largest global event since covid so i, I think the expectation is 22 million visitors uh, over the um the six months and across all demographics and all backgrounds and all yes kind of social and psychological kind of uh, backgrounds um uh, and we've provided like in the public realm very broad um, places for movement, a lot of places to kind of to absorb people, to give them space. So, I mean, we, we, we designed it for um, the, the peak number of visitors. So these only the, the, the highest numbers happen on like between 10 and 15 days, just like in the Olympics, you'd have the game where the day when the 100 meter final, the same bolt was running at the same time as like the final for another event, another event. So this day we called Super Saturday in the Olympics. Um, which had like 200,000 people. We've planned for the same kind of uh, volume at uh, at Expo. So it means that the rest of the time, that day is, those days are equipped for for really good square meterage per person. But it means on the on the normal days of Expo, you'll get like loads of space per person. So there's a, there'll be a, a comfort level there, which um, I think people will be really um, surprised by. I feel very, very, um, um, yeah, comfortable. I think Expo, uh, to come back to Pallavi's point, uh, will be, I think, very exciting for people to visit. 
uh, from the region and also internationally. So it, it will be there's a lot of uh, nature there. There's a lot of parks, the greenery. There's a lot, you know, a lot of thinking about about um, about the the kind of microecology of the place. Uh, but also at the same time, it will be the first time that the world has been able to sort of uh, hug each other in a way since this <laughs> since this crisis happened. It'll be the first time the world comes together. Uh, and and I feel it's a um, yeah it will be this breath um, that we all need like this kind of this this moment of of of, um, of um, a positivity that we need a bit of healing um, and I think it's really great that it's happening uh, in the in the UAE and not like in New York or <laughs> somewhere uh, in the West. It's happening in a part of the world that hasn't had that role, uh, hasn't been given that, that kind of platform. To speak before, and uh, that's that's very exciting for me. Absolutely, uh, maybe uh, David. Actually, I mean, you, you you design quite a lot of sort of cultural projects that also tap into the public sphere. Um, maybe you can talk about you know how we can design spaces within the Middle East or or the Gulf that could still sort of give people um, a chance to you know give voice or to experience it in a way that really empowers them as a community. I mean, I think I think we do see that here as well. I mean, we might not have the big public squares and that within the Middle East, but I think what's definitely blossoming in the last five to ten years here is is the development of galleries, of creative spaces where people can actually express themselves, maybe not in a, a political sense, but in a very creative sense. Um, and that's you know, perhaps that's a more peaceful way of doing it as well. And it, it allows for discourse to happen a little bit more freely, I think, as well, rather than it being a mass movement, it's more of a discussion. Um, so it's a different way of expressing yourselves and particularly here in the UAE I think we've seen in the last three four years a, a massive growth in cultural spaces you know. Pallavi, um you're quite involved in like the public sphere as well you know and, and in sort of supporting you know artisans artists local artists um, and you know the community here do you have sort of some do you have any um, opinions on this as well you know how to empower our communities through sort of cultural and public spaces? Look, I think what David said is just spot on, right? Dubai is a relatively, UAE rather, is a relatively new city. We're trying to find a design voice. I don't think we've quite figured it out yet. And as David said, I love that we're creating that voice through art and through culture. And right now it's happening in pockets, but it's gaining a lot of momentum. And I think all of this started kind of 20 years ago, you know, when Sharjah set up university campus. That was the first of its kind. And, you know, I was raised in this part of the world. This is very much my home. So I feel um, a, my cultural identity is interesting with the UAEs, right? So for me, social sustainability is not just lip service, right? It's not just, hey, I'm going to use a joiner from down the road in Sharjah, or I'm going to build something in Jabal Ali. For me, it's truly bringing the heritage of this place. And a lot of people are like, yeah, does the UAE really have heritage? Yes, in bucket loads, you know? If you look at the tali work, the sadhu weaving, you look at even architecture, the way it was built, you know, historically. And okay, there were adobe structures or what have you, but there's so so much we can learn from that and you know look 90 percent of our population here is is expatriate i get that but a lot of them are people like me who've lived here most of their lives right so they feel very much a part of this community i just want to kind of go back on one thing on the public sphere i don't know about the rest of you david asif and Kurush, but the one thing that kept me going sort of you know and and we were in lockdown kind of in the summer months of Dubai, right? So it's not kind of like London where you can get some fresh air or what have you. You know, you, you step out and you're hit with humidity. Um, what I really craved was that connection to the outdoors, right? Like we talk about biophilia, you know, we talk about phenomenology. We talk about all these things like that ivory tower theoretical side of architecture. But I think for me, COVID really put that in perspective. I was just like, oh my God, what I want right now is not my beautiful interior space, this beautiful house I've designed. What I really want right now is to be in the mountains. And I just remember just craving to go to the beach. And we just forget what an impact nature has on, again, and I'll go back to this world, this word, well-being and wellness. Because for me, it's kind of at the core at what we do as designers. And something else that kind of, not that I grew up because of the COVID, but during the COVID pandemic, you know, a lot of sort of conversations and protests and movements about, 
you know, social justice, about inclusivity, about, you know, everyone feeling a sense of belonging equally. Um, and then that also sort of made everyone contemplate how design and the built environment sort of contributes to that. So I'd like to know um, from your perspective, you know, how do you think design can impact cre uh, in creating spaces or, you know, a society where everyone feels inclusive, where everyone feels inclusive, you know? I think Aiden, like if I can jump in here, because you're asking about inclusivity, right? Like I, I'm brown and I'm a woman in, in, a, in a construction industry, which is very male dominated. I look at all the guys over here on this panel, right? So I'm, I'm not saying I've never, I'm, I'm not a feminist. I'm not going to, you know, look at this from a sexist point of view. But what I do want to say is that from this part of the world, right, a lot of my students at university, 80% of my class was women. In the workforce, there's 20% women. Why is that? So when we talk about inclusivity, it's also creating environments where certain cultures feel safe. We all have a different outlook on what women should do, what women should say, right? And, you know, to each his own, that's fair. But I think inclusivity is much broader than that. I think it has to happen at policy level, at reg level, rather than, you know, again, us as architects. So in the, in the Museum of London, um, and just to give some background, we're basically moving a, um, a museum that's existed since the 70s um, in, its, in its kind of most modern form. We're moving it from the Barbican, which is a great cultural institution in, in London. We're moving it to Smithfield Market, which is a, a meat market which existed for about a thousand years in, um, in out, just outside of the old wall of London. So it didn't, it wasn't destroyed during the fire of London in 1666. So it's an interesting interesting kind of area of a lot of history. Uh, the museum, of course, like any museum, a lot of artifacts from, 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 from history, seven million objects, I think, in its collection. They're not all stored on site, but they would run out of space. Um, the market building is not the most obvious um, building for a, for a museum to rehouse itself within, because um, it's got really large spaces, but that, they're not suited to say, immediately the environmental conditioning that you need for a museum, um, although they are suited to large numbers of people. Well, what was very special about this market building is that the exterior of it, like a lot of market buildings, were full of stalls and stalls face the city, but they also face the interior. And these stalls are basically like shop fronts. So the, so the museum is like a, um, a high street, which has been sort of folded to create a public space, which has got a roof on top. Um, so kind of working as architects, but also um, as uh, in try, trying to help the museum along with its kind of concept of how it can redefine itself in the 21st century, we propose to them to use those houses as spaces for partner institutes. So that's the museum, rather than being a single institute, is like a coral reef of many institutes that come together. So they can invite partners to come and be residents, to provide um, content, uh, to be collaborators. So it means very small institutes can exist, coexist with a very large one. And just to come back to your point, um, I think the public, you know, we, we are, we're all very different and we all need different touch points into cultural institutions. Some of us um, would find like film a way into talking about history, right? Some of us will find that music is a way of talking about um, like London in living memory, for example, it'd be, you know, the punk movement or, uh, you know, to use uh, technology as a way of thinking about the city and, uh, and about the city's future. So the idea is that each of those partners um, can bring in a different way, a different form of research and a different form of um, um, content that individuals can, can connect with. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, uh, all of the responsibility is on the museum to provide that because often when a muse an institute tries to do that, it uh, it struggles because it's uh, it's not really geared up for this kind of rapid change, this agility. Uh, so I think I think um, the, the idea that we need to uh, the idea that we need to adapt the uh, the interface to suit the public and and the, and the interface itself needs to be able to change over time. It's it's um, it seems really obvious, but very few institutions do that. They'll keep with the same program, the same people for many, many years. But this is a way that it can change uh, to suit the times. Uh, so I think I think w with that, uh, it means that uh, 
we will be able to support at the museum a wider range of, of demographic, you know, background, social, social background, kind of cultural background. Um, and we'll use the mediums of, you know, uh, film, music, food, uh, you know, political activism, uh, art, you know, object, uh, object culture, um, and it will all be there. Um, so it's also an experiment. So I think something else interesting is that between the architects and the, the, the institute itself, there's been an openness to try to uh, to create something new. And I think that's very important uh, for for all institutes not to be scared. And this is particularly like addressing the region, it, 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 the UAE and the, the Gulf region in general. Like, like you don't have to copy what's going on in the West uh, and what's going on in you know New York or wherever you actually um, there's a sort of a freedom that you can have to create your own type of institute with its own rules and its own um, uh, possibilities that maybe the West will copy in 10 years time. And, and I think that's, we're starting to see some really interesting things going on in Sharjah. I, I, I agree with Palavi, it's such an interesting place where where they're developing their own, um, you know, Biennale and uh, art, art Biennale and the, uh, architecture Triennale. Um, which are becoming like a, um, uh, I think, a focus point for the region. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. We um, the the kind of in the the resources we bring to our cultural spaces has to be like uh, resilient and has to be um, uh, secure. Like, unfortunately, in the UK, a lot of culture and art field was is like. Is being de de invested um, because of like uh, um, um, because of COVID. It's an excuse to sort of remove money from those things. But actually, at times like this, those are the places that are are going to um, keep us all together and keep us motivated to solve the problems of the world. Um, you know, because yeah, they, they, you need to create a um, a. Uh, a reason for things. You need to create a kind of a goal for people um, and to bring people together. So uh, I think this is best done through inspiring their minds. I mean, there is there is an awareness of what it is like to be a citizen. Uh, I think that sense of trust, as it was talking about, um, and engagement. Um, uh, you know, cities have responsibilities, obviously, that, that creating that sense of belonging for everybody. Um, so to create a, a platform where it is about inclusivity and it's about inclusion, it's, an, it's not about, you know, I mean, Palavi was saying that she's a brown woman, grew up in, in Dubai and Sharjah. Uh, I'm a beige man, grew up in, in London in 1970s, uh, where, you know, it was an extremely tough environment. Um, you know, I've never made it uh, an issue as such, but you know, you want to talk about uh, an institution which is extremely conservative and hardcore, welcome to 1980s um, architecture in, in London. Um, I, I worked briefly in, in the early 80s with, uh, with uh, the Azar, um, you know, she was my tutor and obviously my senior, but you know, occasionally late nights we'd over coffee and other beverages, we had stories to compare. So you want to talk about toughness uh, and non exclude you know, uh, you know, being excluded. Um, but you know, there, there, there are there are scenarios and there are stories to be told. But I think I never dwell in the past and I sort of like to sort of see the world as it has become uh, and in many ways it's, it's, it's a lot better place. That doesn't mean we should be complacent. Uh, I always said that architects and with respect to all my colleagues here, architects think that they play a greater role than you know we architects that we actually do. Um, we love talking, we love having a drink and dinner parties and having conversations and we like the sound of our own voices. Uh, but the reality is that, uh, you know, the, the world is a much bigger place and the machinery of power and movement and dare I say indifference is far greater than passion and articulation. 
Um, but again, I, 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 I thoroughly believe uh, you know, that there, you know, we are privileged um, to A, have an opinion, but B, often some of us have platforms, whether we teach or whether we are seniors in, in an office or we, we have families and so on. So that platform is at that part of the process of engagement. And I think always say people will have rights the minute that they are made aware of them. Um, again, I go back to the early 80s when I started, the mid 80s, not making myself older than I actually am. When I started out as a young graduate, you know, social housing in, in London and the UK was, was, was a sad and dire place. Uh, now you could go to some of the you know, most um, sort of opulent and most expensive part of real estate in the world, you know, in central London or uh, Wapping or wherever. And, you know, you've got uh, sort of integration of social housing, people of different genders, different um, sort of cultures, etc. So the, the, we've made great progress, but to then be able to sort of say what it is like to create societies, which there, it is about uniformity, it's about inclusion, it's about empowerment. It is not going to be just about London, New York, and you know whatever. I mean, there are parts of cities within Europe that you know the, the the concept is completely alien i don't want to mention any particular country, countries for the fear of alienating some some of my good friends that you know i've been having robust uh, discussions with you know in those european countries but the, the idea that the, that that nationalism could have um, alienating uh, sort of impact on those who may or may not belong to, to a particular creed or, or national. It, it, it's, it's still within Europe, uh, in some parts of Europe, it's completely alien. So it is then upon ourselves uh, who, who have experienced it, been through it, and have lived <laughs> to tell the tale, to come back and say, look, uh, this is it. So creating awareness so that people know that there is an alternative, I would say, is perhaps a first uh, that any thought leader or whatever background could be sort of uh, uh, discussing. I think architecture plays a part, uh, uh, urbanism, all of that, they, they, of course, they play a part. Uh, but I think first and foremost, it's about uh, creating the dialogue and creating that, that that awareness. I'll, I'll let David have a have say something. He's missing there very quietly. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you basically just said. Is um, we're very fortunate to sit in the position that we sit in, um, and we do, I think, overestimate ourselves as a profession a lot of the time. But I do also think that we have a role to play in empowering i think that's a very strong word that you said you used um i think as we go forward out of kind of COVID, just to kind of take it full circle back to where we are i think you know we're, we're everyone's breathing in at the moment ourselves as designers developers uh, government institutions everybody's at the moment still taking stock of what we find ourselves in and there's a great opportunity coming out of this for me i think you know palavi mentioned Kind of previous pandemics that the world has been through and that and i think the thing to take away that i've taken away from bits i've been reading and kind of interacting with is after every event like this the world doesn't just fall apart and completely change it, it evolves and that's really what we've got to do now is kind of um learn as much as we can take it on board and, and try and do something good with it not not linger in the, the negativity that is very easily kind of fallen into what what is the role of design going forward if i can say the one thing that we as designers can do i think it's if we could just start from a place of empathy a place of deep empathy and really listen to what our clients want what the community wants what the government is trying to achieve rather than trying to impose what our signature style is or what we think architecture in 2021 should be or what our response to the pandemic should be. I think we just have to listen, absorb, and that's the real genius in our profession, that deep empathy. Um, 
I think the thing for me would be is kind of um, using our voice. That's the thing. I think as a profession, sometimes um, we, we don't stand, stand up enough. enough. We yeah, don't. We, we don't, don't make, make ourselves talented enough. Um, I think in an age of commercialism that we all live in these days, it's it's sometimes tricky. You know, we've all got bills to pay, and we've all got you know employees to support and practices to to make sure we're here tomorrow. But you know, we also as a profession, profession have a responsibility, exactly as Blagi was saying, you know, to protect our end users. The vacuum of, of uh, a sense of, uh, shall we say, uh, um, you know, I hate the word moral, but uh, but there, there there seems to be a, a lack of guidance and responsibility to towards otherness and, and others, uh, which which is really not a good message. Uh, for, for for many people, and we've seen how the, some of those uh, those who always been waiting for those opportunities to actually sort of take control and change the, the definition of uh, you know of the human societies over the last, particularly over the last century and a half, have managed to achieve. There seems to be a reversal of some of those values, and I think now is the time for. For those of us, as I said, we both with the tools and with the awareness and with the passion and care to just come in and say, uh, th 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 look, you know, we've got, we've got, so we've achieved a lot, but we need to retain some core values and we need to promote them. That's, that's, that's so important. Uh, th this, this is kind of, as, as architects and as designers, um, is something. I know, maybe I'm not answering your question properly, but, <laughs> but it's uh, but it's something which I which I've been thinking about a lot. And 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 um, uh, if we if we take a step backwards from from specifically design and the role that design us as designers can play, um, although I agree fully with with what's been said already about empathy, um, I think we have, we have to think about the role that creativity can play. play. And, and I think I think. I think uh, what we should try to do is share uh, imagination and creativity with all people and and to try and encourage people from all sectors of, of kind of, of work, whether they are leaders, whether they're our doctors, our educators, um, uh, you know, artists, economists, we should inspire them to to use their creativity. And sometimes if we need to, to teach them to use their creativity, to be more inventive, uh, and to take risks, to kind of work together, to collaborate, uh, because I think um, the world's uh, problems can't be solved uh, by just um, process. You have to you have to kind of um, leapfrog, and you have to uh, do lateral thinking, um, and I think uh, that can only be that can only happen through creative thinking. And and I think designers spend all a lot of their time. Uh, uh, maybe some is not enough, but as, as much time as we can involved in creative thinking, um, and it's something you know, I think we could uh, we can empower others with. Um, I think empathy and empowerment is a great note to end on. So um, thank you so much to all our panelists today, and thank you to everyone for joining us.